Good morning, Justice Martin. It's Mesa here. Can you hear me? Uh, Mesa, I'm, I'm, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Good, okay, good. Um, so I would like to begin by reading out a statement, which in return yes. I would ask you and counsel to confirm is correct. I hope that is okay. Uh, yes, that would be great. Thank you. The hearing on these applications is being held by way of teleconference with Justice Wayne Martin, the judge hearing this application, uh, while appearing all the way from Australia. Any orders or directions made after or during the course of this application will be issued by the registry in Dubai on Justice Wayne Martin's instructions. Will the judge and party's representatives please confirm that the situation is as I have stated? Yes, it is. Thank you. Yes, good morning. This is Confirmed for the thank you. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, I missed it. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, can I just take appearances, please? Yeah, so we are here for hearing the application of the matter of CFI 21, 2020. The claimant is represented by Evershed Sutherland International LLP. Lead counsel is Amy Rogers. The defendants are represented by KBH Kanoon. Lead counsel is Ghassan Mahmoud. Good. Thank you. All right. Now, who'd like, which, which of counsel would like to start? Ms. Rogers, would it be convenient to go to you first? Certainly, Your Excellency. C can I start by confirming whether my supplemental note of this morning has made its way to you? I saw it about two minutes ago. Um, so it, um, it rather changes what I thought we were going to be doing. But, uh, uh, shall I just get very briefly where we are between the parties? Yes, subject yes. yes that, would, that would be helpful, Ms. Rogers. Now, with my note, there were two draft orders, Your Excellency, one of which related to the trial and case management and one of which related to disclosure. Do you have yes. those? Let me just get them up. They're on my email, so I'll just need to go to another screen if you just bear with me. Now, just one moment. Yes, now the the draft order. Yes, I have a draft adjournment order. Is that the one you're referring me to? That's right. That's right, Your Excellency. Yes. Uh, and for reasons I'll sketch out very shortly, the parties now agree with regret and reluctance that a trial over five days on the existing dates in September is no longer realistic. And we jointly invite the court to adjourn the trial. Uh, yes. I, I can, having... can you just outline for me what? Can you just outline for me, Ms. Rogers? Is that because it can't be ready by then, or is it because of the fear of going part heard? Is because? Uh, yes. I, I must say, I think it's both I'm not. Correctly. I'm not myself so concerned about going part heard. In fact, sometimes there's often an advantage in making a start because you think, sometimes find things go a bit faster, but. If you if you both reach the view that you can't be ready by then, then so be it. I mean, as we stand today, Your Excellency, we haven't exchanged witness statements. You may have gathered that the defendants yes. applied last week for additional time for those. Uh, we're not yet clear, certainly on our side, how many witnesses the defendants will be calling, who they may all be, and the scope of their evidence. We think it inevitable, frankly, that there will be supplemental issues as to disclosure, further witnesses and so forth that arise out of those when we see them. And being realistic, yes. we just don't see the trial being ready. Yes. Well, the only practical issue is that you, you've selected dates in December. I don't know. I know that I'm not available over um, some of those dates, but I don't know if another judge is available. So have, have any inquiries been made of the court as to whether there is a judge available on those dates? Not this morning. We wanted to canvass the position with you first before approaching yes. the registry, but we can. My sisters yes. can certainly do that whilst the hearing is yes. is ongoing. Yes. All right. Well, it's just that, as I say, I can't I can't guarantee availability on those dates, um, but um, we can, we can perhaps look at that. I don't know how much is that. Are those dates chosen? If you could just help me with this, are those dates dates chosen by reference to? availability or by reference to the proposition that you think that's probably the earliest date upon which the matter might be ready? Um, on our side, we think it's the earliest date that the matter might be ready, but also we have difficulties on council availability before December. Well, we would be available right. for other dates in December, but not in advance of December. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. 
well, we can perhaps some inquiries can be made of registry. I mean, if if, if we if we can't get a definitive position, I can just adjourn it, adjourn it to a date to be fixed, and then there can be negotiations between the parties and the registry about about another date. Very grateful. Entirely understood. Well, th th that <laughs> question of adjournment. There are then some consequential yes. questions that arise from that. Um, yes. First, and everything probably follows from this is whether there is sense in using the dates that are presently fixed on the 6th and 7th of September for case management. Uh, and what yeah. I have in mind there, Your Excellency, is this. We're hopeful, but again, I'll return to that, to have seen the defendant's evidence by that stage. And insofar as it has the sort of scope and reach that we rather fear it will have, <laughs> giving rise to applications on our side, both potentially one, to control and limit the scope of the evidence to keep it focused on the issues. Secondly, for disclosure, insofar as necessary, arising from those statements, and that may include non-party disclosure. And frankly, anything else that needs to be resolved once we've actually seen which witnesses are coming and what they propose to say. It, it seemed to us, but subject very much to, to your views, that there was good sense in seizing the day on the dates that we have in the diary, lancing those issues then, and ensuring that there's no question then of further adjournments or further derailment as we get closer to the trial date. So on our well, side, well, well that, that seems to me to be sensible, but of course I'll have to hear from Mr. Canoon uh, about that. But so for, on your side, are, are your witness statements ready to serve? They're, they're ready. Yes, all right. Good, thank you for that. Uh, well, I, I should say, yeah, I'm corrected, but, that they haven't all been signed, but they can be ready as soon as the court directs that they do yes. serve. Yes, all right. Good, thank you for that. Now, what else would you like to talk to me about? Well, the only other uh, issue as to directions that flows is as to the date for statements, and I'll take that very shortly. Yes. We suggest the 18th of August. Defendants have previously yes. said that they can be ready by next Tuesday, which is the date to which they were seeking an extension of time. Um, I understand from a learned friend he'd now like to the very end of August, but obviously that would take off the table the possibility of using the 6th and 7th September. So we say yes. he thought he could be ready for Tuesday, he should be ready for a very short period after Tuesday, and then let's make good use of the time we have in the court's diary. Yes, so the, the matters you'd have in mind ventilating on the 6th and 7th are the ambit, if you like, of the trial relevance. So is that one of the things that you want, wish to raise? It is. Yes, all right. And then supplementary disclosure. Uh, and that may include non-party disclosure against uh, yes. two of the individuals that would be appearing as witnesses. Yes. Well, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, ha I'm av obviously available on the 6th and 7th because that's when we're supposed to be doing the trial. Um, there is, as I mentioned, there's a risk that I won't be the trial judge. Um, in an ideal world, it would probably be better for these things to be dealt with by the trial judge, but I am fully appraised of the matter. I've read all the papers, um, so I, I suppose that it would be difficult for somebody, or well, not impossible, but somebody else would have to get up to speed between now and the 6th. I think that might be might be challenging. So it's, even if I'm not the trial judge, there's probably utility in me hearing those applications. Do you have anything to say about that, Ms Rogers? I see good sense in that, Your Alex, and nothing further. Yes. Yes, all right, thank you. All right, well, thank you for that. Now, Mr. Canoon. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, firstly, Your Excellency, my surname is Mahmood, Mr. Mahmood. Um, I'm Mahmood, uh, sorry. Your are... <laughs> That's quite all right. Uh, Your Excellency, firstly, can I thank my friend for summarising the issues? She's neatly identified the salient points. The, the, the three points being, firstly, the adjournment of, of the, the trial. Uh, Melanchthon has identified in fairly neutral terms. Uh, I, I agree that uh, the matter is, is not likely to be ready by the deadline, that is by, by September. But in any event, I also question very strongly, and I've always questioned very strongly, as of my lawyers recently, whether or not this case can actually be concluded in the time frame uh, that has been allotted. But for all the reasons advanced by Ms. Rogers, I support her submission that the matter ought to be adjourned off. Uh, as far as the consequential directions are concerned, uh, there are principally two consequential directions uh, that are being proposed. Firstly, witness statements by a certain date to be agreed, uh, and there is a dispute between the parties as to what date that should be, and I, I can expand on that in due course. The second matter yes. is whether or not there ought to be a case management conference uh, allocated on the 6th and 7th of September. Uh, and, of course, that in itself will turn largely on whether or not uh, your, your Excellency agrees with me as to the date for exchange of witness statements. 
There is, of yeah. course, a third matter, which is the supplemental disclosure issue. And in my submission, that is probably the first matter that the court uh, will need to consider and address, because I, I strongly suspect that the rest of the directions will, will fall into place once your, your Excellency has decided that issue. Now, by way of yeah. example, if I could just refer you to the draft orders, uh, your, your Excellency yeah. should have two draft orders. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I've got one... There, let me look. I've got three emails. An update. Oh, there we are. There's a, another. There's an adjournment order on a draft consent order redisclosure. Right. Okay. Yes, I've opened Absolutely. that now. Thank you. Now, 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 in relation to that, if you actually go to the first page, you'll see there are a number of recitals. Uh, and the last yes. recital is basically uh, an agreement or understanding that the defendants will provide further disclosure. But it's strictly on, without prejudice to their view, they've, they've, uh, without prejudice to their argument that they're not in breach of the previous disclosure orders. And if, you, if you, your excellency then turns to paragraph two, yes, you will see at paragraph two b, there is a date that is agreed by all concerned that the supplemental disclosure is to be provided by the 23rd of August, and yes. that is the same date which is at paragraph. 3D and at paragraph 4. So the effect of this ag agreement by all concerned is that disclosure will be affected by the 23rd of August. So one is left pondering why uh, are the parties disclosing witness statements before the disclosure exercise is complete. If your excellency with that in mind then goes to the draft... Well, could I just say, could I just, Mr. Mamed, could I, sorry, Mr. Mamed, could I just give you one rhetorical answer to that? And that is because this is the exchange of witness statements in, in chief and that there will be presumably an opportunity for witness statements in reply that might then take into account the disclosure, mightn't there? It, 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 indeed, and, and that is one answer. And may I, may I respectfully just counter that answer with this? It, it is certainly from a cost perspective far better for disclosure to be completed and for there to be one round of exchange of statements than there to be two. Um, the, the supplemental responsive statement statements will only be, be required if there are, there are matters missing from the first statements. The point is a very oh, but, simple but, one, but, that if the, the disclosure... Surely, uh, I mean, it, it, there, will have to, there will be witness statements in response, won't there? I would have thought inevitably uh, there will be course, responsive witness statements. And the responsive statements could then pick up any material covered in disclosure. It, it, indeed, that is one way forward. But, of course, the, the preference yeah. and the, the usual course is for disclosure always to be completed beforehand and for statements then to be filed, particularly in this case where there are a, a, a range of factual issues. Now, there are the well, there are some, Mr. Mahmoud, there's, 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 there's some, sorry, Mr. Mahmoud, there are some jurisdictions in this part of the world where that's not the usual practice. The usual practice in, for example, the commercial list of the Supreme Court of New South Wales is for witness statements before disclosure. Um, and, it, and it works, it, and it works very well. <laughs> Your Excellency has an advantage over me. You, you plainly have more more experience of that that jurisdiction. Well, well, there, there, are there, are two, there are two advantages. There are a couple of it, Mr. Mamid. You know, the, the reason they've done it, and there are a couple of advantages. The first is that witness statements without complete disclosure tend, first of all, to be um, based on properly based on the information that is available to the witness, not upon something else that's been put in the witness mind, and they tend to be less argumentative. So uh, there are those that think it's actually that, that the normal process whereby you have disclosure before witness statements is actually putting the cart before the horse. But anyway, I digress. I, I, well, I, I certainly defer to your, your Excellency's experience in that regard. I see, I see certainly logic for that, for that uh, analysis certainly in different parts of the world. But there, there are, in fact, two different reasons that I advance to, to, to um, support the proposition that statements ought to be adduced after the 28th of August. Uh, so, sorry, after the 23rd of August. The first being the point that I just made, that disclosure ought to take place first, and, and your Excellency has my submissions on that. The second point is also that certainly would, it, would, it would be beneficial, especially to the defendants, to take stock of the position and provide their statements in a more timely fashion 
rather than in an expedited, truncated manner in which these proceedings have been conducted thus far. Uh, your Excellency will be aware that the directions were originally provided on the 11th of June, and the directions were extraordinarily tight and had to be because of the idea of having an expedited trial in September. Uh, and the consequence of that has been a, a, an extraordinarily huge amount of work in a very short space of time. Um, and during that period of time, Your Excellency may well be aware from the documents you read that the primary legal team, which, was, which consisted of Mrs. Amit as being the lead counsel and lead solicitor, has now been replaced by an alternative team because of her pregnancy uh, and uh, the fact that she gave birth in rather difficult medical circumstances. So the, the consequence and the knock on effect of this has been a great deal of work in a very short space of time. Uh, and certainly we would plead with the court that further time should be given in this regard to make sure that the statements are absolutely clear and properly served by the 28th of August, rather than in a rush form, which is never desirable in a case that is as fact sensitive as a current case. Now, as far as prejudice is concerned, there is literally no prejudice at all, save for one matter. Um, of course, if the trial is adjourned off, as both parties contend, and if the trial does take place sometime towards the end of the year, then there is little sense in trying to rush and truncate the direction for witness statements in such a manner that might in itself lead to prejudicial issues in due course. The, the, the only prejudice or possible prejudice that might arise is the fact that if the statements are served on the 28th of August, as I propose, <coughs> that will of course have a, a consequential knock-on effect, and it will mean that the case management conference can't take place on the date that has been proposed currently. <coughs> now that is not actually in reality uh, an actual prejudice to any party concerned because there is no need for this court answer with respect to actually list the matter for a case management conference currently in the hope or in the expectation that the parties might make applications. The fact that they haven't yet made applications is, is determinative of the point. And the usual course is for the, for the court to list applications when they are made, not list the matter in anticipation of them being made. So I, I would respectfully suggest in the round the matter or the statements ought to be uh, served on the 28th of August, providing more time to the parties. And thereafter, if there are consequential matters, the parties can liaise on those matters in correspondence. If that is not resolved, then whoever wishes can make an application, and that application will be dealt with properly at a case management conference if need be. But that that well, should be the ordinary course. Well, Mr. Mahmood, I'm just going back to your point about disclosure, I must say I'm, I'm having trouble understanding your point because the additional disclosure is to be given by your clients, isn't it? Yes, yes. So the, the information is within if it exists and of course your clients, both <laughs> your corporate client and your personal client have both filed statements which they've said to be true in which they assert that none of these documents exist, haven't they? Indeed. Yes, they have. So why would I apprehend that compliance with this obligation by the 23rd of August is likely to have any impact on the production of witness statements? Uh, because, uh, uh, Your Excellency, the supplemental disclosure sort now is actually much wider in terms. And, and Your Excellency may recall at the very beginning of my submissions, I said uh, very openly that whilst we're in agreement to provide uh, a further round of disclosure, we do not accept that any of the documents are relevant or probative or, or in fact, uh, uh, pertinent to these proceedings. But what is being said right, well, now... Can you, sorry, can you, can you, Mr. Mavid, can you tell me where, the, what, in, what categories are wider than the categories sought in the application? If you're... Um, it looks if, very if, much if, like you know, the doc, no, no. But what I, the point that I'm making is that the disclosure that is being sought currently that we're agreeing to is much wider than the standard disclosure provisions which were originally made by the court. Yes, and I understand that. But, but, but say, Mr. Mahmoud, just, just, just listen to me, please. Um, the point I made to you was that your clients have each signed statements which they assert to be true, saying that they have actually done searches for the documents that were categorised in the application, and there are no documents. And the basis upon which, yeah. that was the basis upon which the application was resisted. So my question is, Indeed. and was, why then would I apprehend, given that both of your clients have sworn, well not sworn, but stated 
statements said to be true, that there are no documents within these categories, why will the provision of a further statement by their lawyers to that effect on the 23rd of August have any impact upon the witness statements to be disclosed? Your Excellency, the answer to that is, is fairly straightforward. The answer is, it will not, we suspect. But what I say for out of the abundance of caution is to ensure that the disclosure exercise is completed before the statements are filed. But if Your Excellency is against me on that point, I, I don't push that point any further forward. Yes, but just right. to be absolutely Well, clear, I, am, I am against my, you on that point. point. I, just can't, I just can't see that you... I can't see how that has any impact on the timetable. And I'm, and I'm struggling to see why, when you ha yourself applied for an extension of time to put on all the witness statements by Tuesday, why you shouldn't be in a position to put them on by Tuesday week. Uh, Your Excellency, you have my point. I, I, I don't yes. wish to take up your time unnecessarily by repeating the same point. In, in essence, the, the, the simple point is this. We've done a great deal of work in a very short space of time uh, and plainly would like to take stock of all the statements before serving them. But if Your Excellency is against me on that, I, I can't really advise enough in well, way. Mr Mahmood, there, there's, a, there's an inference from the application that was made on your client's behalf to produce witness summaries rather than statements, that that work commenced rather late. Uh, you started writing to prospective witnesses a few days before that application was brought in the last half of July. Um, and it, it seems there does seem to be some evidence to suggest that the reason you're behind the, behind the temporal requirements of the timetable is because you just haven't been keeping up. What do you say to that? Oh, uh, quite a lot. H has your Excellency seen a copy of my skeleton arguments on the point? Uh, which uh, which... Nine, page when was the skeleton argument filed? Uh, it, 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 your Excellency, it was filed last week, and it's at tab 9, page 75 of Your Excellency's bundle. Uh, I, did, I haven't seen a bundle. Um, let me go to that. Ah, there, there should be a it should be a very large bundle of documents um, comprising more than, I think, well, I, I think it's about a thousand pages now, or maybe, maybe a bit less. But it's very, very long, and there are lots of authorities from both sides. All right, just let me find it. I've got a bundle dated 26th of July I have available to me. Is there another? Oh, oh there's, here we go. Another court application. For, which bundle are you talking about? I've got several. There's one for court application for the specific disclosure. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Sixth of, all right, let me have a look. I've just got to find it on the case management system. That's all, Mr. Mamo. Just bear with me. Of course. Yes, here we go. So now it, it's a specific disclosure application index. Now, whereabouts in the bundle is it? It's uh, your Excellency. If you turn to tab nine, do, do you have tabs? Because everybody else has yes, been working. Yes, defendant's response. Tabs. Yes, 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 yes. Hang on. Thank you. That, that, that's that's the point. Tab nine, tab nine page yes. one. Uh, at tab on. nine, page one. It begins with a, a witness statement from Mr. Singh which deals with the, with, with the criticism that are being made in terms of how the application was made and why it was made in that way. Has your Excellency yes. had a chance to consider that document, or should I speak you through yes, it? Yes, I've, I've, I've read Mr. Singh's witness statements. Thank you. Now, he explains okay. in his statement the sequence of events and uh, in, includes the number of documents in support of that. Uh, and your Excellency, just by way of background, so that I can answer your criticism uh, squarely, uh, by way of chronology, Your Excellency may recall that a case information management sheet was, was served by the respective parties. Uh, and in that sheet, uh, those who represent me identified initially five witnesses. But within the body of that sheet, you may recall from Mr. Singh's statement, it was made absolutely clear that this may change on receipt of disclosure. Uh, and of course, by that stage, on the 11th of June, 
or uh, at the time when the case information sheet had been served, disclosure was to take place fairly soon thereafter. In fact, disclosure did take place thereafter, and uh, what we received was approximately 5,000 circa pages uh, of various documents from the other side. Now, Your Excellency may recall from the statement of Mr. Singh, uh, the case management hearing took place on the 11th of June. Mrs. Ahmed, who was dealing with the case, gave, went on maternity leave very, very shortly after that, but with the hope and intention of resuming her duties very shortly. She gave birth on the 20th of June, but due to uh, complicated medical emergencies, she hasn't been able to resume her duties at work. And it, it was because of that that a new legal team was then retained uh, sometime in July, the very beginning of July, I seem to recall. But, but the upshot of that was that we essentially lost two or three weeks at that point in time through essentially no fault of our own through, through a misadventure. And well, I'm not, that, Mr. Mahmoud, I'm just not sure that, Mr. Mahmoud, I'm, 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 I'm hearing you, but I just have trouble with that because um, the second defendants provided very lengthy particulars of all the matters that he says gave rise to effectively a repudiatory breach of the contract of employment, some 83 separate instances, identifying all the people involved. He knew that the people he was talking about were all his fellow employees. And that was given, those particulars were given well before the case management conference in June, but it wasn't until the 21st of July that letters were written to the seven prospective witnesses in respect of whom witness some was sought. Uh, That's right. Is, isn't that right? As a matter of chronology, that is correct. And what I'm well, speaking well, then doesn't that support the inference yeah. that you just, well, just listen to me, Mr. Moore. Doesn't that support the inference that preparation has been left very late? For whatever reason. Um, certainly, well, uh, if, if there's whatever reason that I'm addressing your, your Excellency, yes, because well, when seeking but, to attribute blame... But, but the, the uh, fact that the principal lawyer was pregnant was certainly well known to everybody, presumably for about nine months. So one would have thought that arrangements would have been made to cover for that lawyer during the time of her confinement and for as long as that took. It just seems to me to be somewhat um, risky, to, to say the least, to rest the case entirely in the hands. If what you're saying is the case was left entirely in the hands of someone who was to have a baby, that doesn't seem to me a particularly prudent way of preparing for an expedited trial, I have to say. Uh, certainly, one can't substitute hindsight with foresight. Uh, with hindsight, of course, one can make that criticism, but at the time, for whatever reason, Your Excellency, the view was taken that uh, Mrs. Ahmed would return. She had had conduct of the case from the very outset and was therefore fully familiar with all the issues rather than somebody else taking over such a large case. Uh, so the view, rightly or wrongly, was taken that matters ought to remain with her, and that was the expectation. But as I said, I've explained the, the background, whether Your Excellency accepts that as a, as a reason or not, it is a matter to Your Excellency. But fast forwarding forward in time, uh, Your Excellency is right that as a matter of chronology, contact was made with various witnesses on the 21st of July. And, and it became apparent that witnesses were uh, at that point in time either unwilling or unable to engage because of the confidentiality provisions which, which bound them. And the, uh, in fairness to the claimants, they have now produced copies of those settlement agreements, which they seem to imply or they seek to imply did not bind those witnesses, but in actual fact, the settlement agreement completely do bind or potentially bind those witnesses. So there was very good reason for the individuals not to engage in the process. Uh, and your Excellency thereafter has the chronology of events. Uh, an application was made on the 26th of July, granted by your Excellency, I believe, on the 29th of July. Uh, and subsequent to that, on the 30th of July, the, uh, the, the uh, claimants uh, indicated their consent and subsequently, on the 31st of July, made an application to, to set aside the orders. Now, Your Excellency, in respect to that point, uh, what you will note is that the application itself was made on the 31st of July, which was a bank holiday. And the 30th of July, which is the very first time Evershed indicated they had no objection to the witnesses giving evidence, was also a bank holiday. So the application was made very, very quickly indeed. But as it was, as soon as we became aware that they were no longer objecting to the position, your Excellency may or may not be aware of the correspondence, but on the 3rd of August, those who instruct me sent an email to the other side thanking them 
and making it clear that in those circumstances, they would, instead of witness summaries, obtain witness statements. But we, from that date onwards, we've been trying to obtain statements. However, uh, Your Excellency, a further problem developed. Again, I, I'm sure Your Excellency is aware of this from the correspondence. But on the 4th of August, one of the, the, the lawyers representing one of the intended witnesses uh, appeared uh, to be discontent or unhappy with the, the wording of the consent provided by Evershed and asked for more clarification on that, uh, as a result of which he then gave advice to his lawyers uh, and the, the, the documentation relations that is attached to the bundle of uh, Mr. Singh at pages 49 onwards. So the unequivocal consent was only given on the 4th of August for all the witnesses to give statements. So we've been rather quickly and hurriedly preparing statements since that date uh, with the anticipation of serving them on Tuesday and asking for a short extension. But now that the matter uh, is being vacated, all that I'm asking for is a little bit more time for the task to be undertaken properly rather than hurriedly. Uh, Your Excellency, would you like me to take you through those exhibits that I've mentioned? No, no, I'm familiar with the timetable in relation to all of that. Um, but but it, just, in relation to the, just in relation to the orders that I made in relation to the provision of summaries rather than witness statements, it's uh, implicit that that order will be set aside. Is there is there anywhere in the draft orders that have been prepared that actually does that? It, it does, uh, uh, Your Excellency. It's not, not implicit, Where do I see that? Explicit. Um, I'm sorry? I believe it's at, uh, in the disclosure order. Paragraph in the disclosure order, is it? Right, let me, let me just pull that up. <coughs> Yes. All right. Good. All right. And just just to be clear on the chronology, Your Excellency, and I just want this to make this point absolutely clear, uh, the first time uh, consent was given to obtain statements was the 30th of July, which I believe was on the day, which is Thursday, and the first uh, and as soon as we returned back to work, which is the 3rd of August, that being the end of the public holiday, as soon as that we were back to work, uh, Lucy Nash of KB8 sent an email which is at exhibit page 139, saying, as you have confirmed the individuals are not prevented from giving evidence and that you have no objection to any of them giving evidence, we intend to serve witness statements accordingly. So since that day, there has been right. absolutely no objection. Yes, all right. Uh, anything else, Mr. Mahmoud? Was drafted and, uh, you reckon you know, I think I'd be repeating myself if I did. Thank you for your time. Yes, all right. Yes, thank you. Now, Ms. Rogers, back to you. Um, just tell me again, what, what do you apprehend is likely to be debated at the CMC on the 6th and 7th of September that you're proposing? It's three things, Your Excellency. First is the scope of the defendant's evidence once we finally see it, uh, and whether we're inviting the court to control and limit the scope of it, potentially exclude entire witnesses or passages of the evidence to ensure that it is focused on the issues for trial. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we actually. Well, sorry, can I just? Sorry, Ms. Rogers, can I just stop you there? That is, that is. Um, it would be unusual for that to be done well in advance of trial. That's the sort of thing that's usually done in the course of a trial, and uh, unless you can demonstrate that there would be significant prejudice in the form of unnecessary cost and delay. Um, there wouldn't normally be a, a pre-trial vetting of witness statements for relevance, would there? Well, it's precisely because there would be cost and delay that we'd be making the application. Let, let me test it for you this way, Your Excellency. We anticipate, for example, that some of these statements will be from former employees who left considerable time ago, who make allegations, so it appears, as to what happened to them during the course of their employment. Now, those aren't pleaded allegations. They're not allegations that anyone's given any disclosure in relation to, and they're not allegations that we've prepared any evidence in relation to. It will depend on what is said when we see those statements, but if that is their form, uh, the submission we would be making to the court is, this is evidence of peripheral uh, relevance, if any relevance at all, and if you permit it to go forward in this way, there'll be considerable further expense and work required before trial that, that simply isn't necessary or proportionate. That will be the submission. Well, as I say, the, the hurdle would be cut pretty high. Would, in order to persuade a court of that, 
the, the hurdle will be fairly high because ordinarily relevance will be tested at a trial and if we're talking about a 10-day trial, one never knows in advance of trial quite what evidentiary leads are to be followed. In relation to your pleading point, of course, there's a significant difference between the matters that are appropriately pleaded and matters that might be relevant on the evidence. And to take one example that I've seen raised in the papers before me, um, you object to relevance in relation to alleged mistreatment of other employees, the defendants say that is relevant because the defendant says that his complaints fell on deaf ears and the fact that other similar complaints fell on deaf ears is relevant to the likelihood of that having occurred because it shows that there weren't systems in proper systems in place in order to provide him with a safe working environment. Um, as evidenced by the failure of a, a widespread practice of failing to respond adequately to previously com previous complaints. Now, on the face of it, that second argument would, would seem ordinarily to establish sufficient relevance to get the evidence in. The question of its weight, of course, will depend upon the nature of the evidence. Um, but, but that's the sort of thing that I think you know, it, it, it's hard to rule on those sort of things too far in advance of the trial unless it's absolutely clear that the evidence is irrelevant. I fully take that point, Your Excellency. I mean, it, it is an issue that arises not infrequently in cases like this where an employee is saying, yes. well, you know, look at the backdrop. And certainly yes. in, in English jurisdiction, the, the, the courts and tribunals do grapple with the question, well, where, where is the line drawn? Obviously, something might be said to be logically relevant or conceivably relevant, but is it nevertheless yes. appropriate that it all goes forward to trial? Uh, and we hear, of course, what you say, but we're mindful that no court would want to be excluding or limiting evidence if it wasn't absolutely plain that that was the right course. But from yes. what we've seen so far, we do think, subject to seeing the statements, that we may well be in that territory. So that, that, yes, that's all right. So, yes, yes. Two others, much, much shorter. One, you may have seen reference in the papers to Mr. Morozov and Mr. Rudman. Yes. Who are two particular individuals who we understand are now uh, proposed to be called. Now, they are relevant to these proceedings in two ways. One, one in the allegations that it appears they intend to make, but two also in that they seem to have been one of the links between Mr. Olianju and GNG uh, in the process of his recruitment. Now, as things stand, uh, they have not given disclosure from their personal mobile phones, and they weren't informed by GMG in that period, of the messages that they hold from that time and in relation to these issues. Uh, and that is on the basis that their personal mobile phones, they're not within GMG's control. For so long as they weren't coming as witnesses, we were content to leave the position lie as it stood there. But if they're coming to trial and they're coming to give evidence, we certainly would not be content with that position. And the intention is to seek non-party disclosure from them of the documents they hold relevant to Mr. Oli Andrew's recruitment. So that's the second yes. action. Yes. Uh, the third will depend entirely on the evidence when we see it, uh, Your Excellency, but it's this. We will anticipate that if there is wide ranging evidence in relation to unpleaded matters, and if the view is taken either on our side or on the part of the court that it is appropriate that that goes to trial, it's readily foreseeable that that will give rise to further disclosure requests uh, as between us and either potentially witnesses or the defendants um, that, that relates to those statements. And if they're to come on, we say they should come on as soon as possible. But, but wouldn't the disclosure be documents within your position, power, custody or control? Because they would be the evidence will presumably relate to incidents that occurred during the course of employment with your clients. So won't you have those documents? Oh, those documents, certainly, certainly we will, and those would be searches on our side, absolutely. Uh, but we anticipate... Well, what, other, what, what other documents are you thinking of? Well, th there may well be documents that the individual potential witnesses hold that relate to the circumstances in which they left and why that was. Uh, and equally, there may be... I, I, this really will depend on the scope of the evidence. There may be further requests that we want to make of the defendants in relation to um, the matters, that, particularly Mr. Ole Andrew, in relation to the matters that, that the witnesses speak to. But all that I fully accept will depend on what precisely the witnesses say. Yes, all right. So they're the, they're the matters that you apprehend might come up. They are. Yes, all right.
Um, but Mr. Mahmood, just in relation to the second matter, um, the app apprehended application for disclosure orders against Messrs. Moritzov and Rudman, um, do you have any submissions to make in relation to that? Uh, just this, two matters. Uh, first, today is the first time that I'm hearing about the possibility of third-party disclosure against those witnesses. Secondly, in fact, I have three points, that being the first point. The second point is, uh, you, you, your Excellency may have seen from the documents, Morozov and Rudman have been involved in early litigation involving the claimants, and, and their yes. case was sufficiently advanced. I understand a trial had been listed at some point, and statements had been taken. So all the documents they require in that case the disclosure process and everything relevant to that process has already taken place. So I do, I do raise a large question mark over the, the viability of a third-party disclosure request in those circumstances. And the third point is perhaps more significant. Uh, it, it also, the, the point being made by my friend, in my submission, with the greatest respect, misrepresents the relevance or the issues in the case. Now, you, you, Your Excellency, as I said before, uh, plainly have the documents but I've filed a rather lengthy skeleton argument in which what I've done is I've distilled the pleadings, the particular, the defence and the reply together with the appendix to identify what the issues are and the areas that the witnesses will therefore be talking about. Uh, and if you excellently can turn, turn back to tab nine, if you have it to yes. hand. Yes, just bear with me. Yeah. Yes. Um, at page 87... Yes, just bear with me. I think it'd be page 83, in fact. 83, just bear with me. It's all loading up. Yes, I have it now. Thank you. Thank you. Under the heading submissions on relevance, uh, I, I, yes. think, I, I think it's common ground between the parties that only evidence which is relevant is potentially admissible, subject to the court's discretion then to exclude it, based on all the factors your Excellency referred to previously. And at paragraph 22, I've made reference to the pleadings and the 83 incidents. And at 22A, I've set out the various terms of the, the contract by reference to case law. And then perhaps more importantly, at paragraph 22C, yes. I've made reference to the reply, which is, the, which is, which is what uh, assists the court in identifying what the issues are. And this is the important point here. What the, uh, the, the, the defendants have done is set out in very clear detail in the, uh, the defence and then subsequently in the appendix, 83 instances where the second defendant says he was subject to the harassment of various kinds and various incidents. But what the claimants have not done is answered a single one of those incidents. It, that the case appears to be predicated on a general denial, essentially meaning that all those issues are, are denied, uh, not, notwithstanding their, their own grievance findings. If Your Excellency then turns with that in mind uh, to page 87. Yes. At paragraph H, having distilled the pleadings, I, I then, I hope, accurately set out the, the range of factual issues. I, I, and there are a number of factual issues, principally being whether the, de the second defendant suffered the act in question, whether he, he was harassed by his managers, whether he made complaints, whether other staff made complaints about the same managers and the knowledge of the grievances and the steps taken to abate the harassment and so on. And having done that, at paragraph 23 and 24, I identified, therefore, what the issues will be for proof purposes. And principally, paragraph 24, there are therefore three categories upon which the witnesses will plainly be in a position to give relevant evidence, if indeed they can. And the, uh, the evidence that the witnesses will focus on will be the treatment of the second defendant by his managers, the treatment of those witnesses by the same managers during the relevant period in respect of which they then made complaints or informal complaints, and the failure of the claimants then to take action to heed those complaints, that, that being one of the central features of this case. In that context, 
What we will not be seeking to do is essentially widen the scope to, to bring in irrelevant matters. Of course, there will have to be discussions by the individuals concerned about what their complaints were in order to put context to category number two. But the principal focus of this case obviously will be primarily the second defendant, but also the fact that management was fully aware of the complaint and they did nothing to, to take action, that being a central tent of this case. So in that context, I, I must quiz the, the, the suggestion that third-party disclosure may be relevant to this case. I, I'm struggling to understand how, given particularly that it's never been practiced previously. Uh, so uh, that's the only point that I make at this stage. Of course, we've got to keep our power to drive because I have no idea how the application will be made and on what premise currently. And of course, I must also preface my submissions by pointing out that at this stage, I must confess that I haven't yet seen the statement, but I, I am aware that the preparation is, is geared towards identifying relevant categories. Uh, you excellent to go yes. to my submission. Yes, thank you. Well, Ms. Rogers, um, Mr. Mahmood has, has touched upon a, a point that was concerning me, which is not anything anybody has raised. And that is the, the significance of Appendix 1 to the relevant pleading, in which, which has the 83 instances of conduct which cumulatively are said to give rise to a repudiatory breach of the employment agreement. Now, at the moment, your clients simply don't admit any of those, do they? So wouldn't it, wouldn't it be convenient if sometime between now and trial, I'm not saying necessarily immediately, but perhaps after you've seen the witness statements, would it be helpful if there was some response to those particulars, saying what you admit and what you don't admit? Could you see the force of that? And I think it's a very sensible idea. What, what we could perhaps do once statements have been exchanged uh, is effectively a schedule that says these are the allegations, this is where the evidence is found, and this is what our position is on each of them. Well, that then suggests to me that that might be a useful adjunct to, or at least precursor to any disputed interlocutory process, um, because then we would be able to identify just what was in dispute and what wasn't. Um, and that, that's, that's not going to happen by the 6th of September, I wouldn't have thought. Well, I'm um, not so sure that, that can say. I mean, obviously, we take it in two stages. One, the reason that there's no responsive pleading is because those allegations came out only by way of Part 19 request, not as a um, pleaded part of the defence. But two, and we are obviously ready to exchange witness statements and we have addressed them. So as and when statements are exchanged, and we do say the sooner the better so that we can get a grip of this case going forward, uh, we'll be in a position to move very quickly to identify to the court precisely what is an issue relevant and so forth. Yes. All right. Um... Can I just address one point head on just to correct something that was said a moment ago? Uh, for, for the record, which is the suggestion that non-party disclosure hasn't previously been mentioned. It is referred to specifically both in Ms. John's witness statement in relation to witness summaries and in paragraph 50 of my original skeleton argument. So that submission just simply isn't correct. Yes. All right. Well, um, the, the issues then that I have to determine are really it's the starting point is the date upon which the witness statements are to be exchanged. And that really turns upon whether or not there's going to be any utility in preserving those dates on the 6th and 7th of September. Can I just ask Ms Rogers, in relation to those dates, obviously you've got, I assume you've got trial counsel reserved over that period, they would therefore be available. But is, is that the main reason for focusing on those dates? Are there other dates perhaps later in September that, that would be just as efficacious? No, that, that's why we focused on those dates. There are other commitments on our side after this trial window. Yes. All right. And the, 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 I would the, say, Your Excellency, if it helps, so we focused on the 6th and the 7th as being the start of the window. Equally, of course, all of the dates of the proposed trial were reserved, so there's no difficulty with so, choosing later dates. So you could go a bit later. Um, well, I suppose then the, the question is whether we should simply preserve those 
set a timetable for the exchange of statements that enables you to take advantage of those dates if you wish to do so. So in other words, I can't, in terms of the draft order that's presently be, been prepared, it, it, it rather anticipates that any application that is to be made will have to be made by those times. I'm not sure that that's particularly useful because one doesn't know how wide in ambit the witness statement served will be, I imagine fairly wide if there's a lot of documents. And I just wonder if all the issues that will have, that are likely to arrive will have arisen in time for those matters to be adequately heard on the sixth uh, uh, and sometime over that trial window. But having said that, we were of course supposed to be having a trial then, so we should be able to, if we were going to be having a trial then we should be able to get ready for a CMC application. Um, so you, there aren't any dates, you're not aware, Ms Rogers, of any dates later in September that would be convenient to your council? Yeah, I, I know I personally have no dates after the end of the trial in September. I don't have Mr Crowe's dates in front of me, but we would want right. both of us to be available. Your, your leader, yes, all right. Um, well, it might be, yes, all right. Well then, on, on the question of when the witness statements should be served, uh, I'm, I must say I'm not persuaded by the proposition that there is any significance to the date that the parties have selected as the date for the provision of further disclosure for the reasons which I developed in argument. Um, it seems to me to be unlikely that the, the disclosure, if there is any to be made by the 23rd of August, will have any material impact upon the witness statements, not least because uh, Mr Mode's clients have sworn statements in which they say there are no documents meeting those descriptions and in any event there will be another step in the process whereby witness statements in reply will be put on and so I can't see any reason why the witness statements shouldn't precede um, the provision of any further disclosure that's been agreed. In relation to the date by which they should be provided, the date of the 6th of August was set um, in early on the 11th of June when directions were made. I understand there have been difficulties in the Defendant Solicitor's Office in relation to preparation for trial, but as recently as late last week, the Defendant applied for an extension of time for the provision of statements until Tuesday the 11th of August. Uh, in that circumstance, it's hard for me to see that, to, to accept that there would be any significant prejudice in giving the Defendants a week further than the time which they actually asked for, that is to provide that they be provided by the 18th of August. And the advantage of that will be that if um, there are any applications that are to be made as a result of the provision of those witness statements, then opportunity can be taken in respect of the trial window, um, which is provided uh, between the 6th and the 7th of September. I think, Ms Rogers, it might be more convenient, rather I'm just look, re looking at my own calendar, but it might be a bit safer instead of reserving the first two days in that period, might be better to reserve the last two days in that period, just to give ourselves a little more, a little more time. That that would be the 9th and the 10th of September, I think. Agreed. Yes. So so then, using which should I use as a template? Should I use the? There are two draft orders. There's the draft order for. This is called the draft adjournment order. So, using that. Um, in, in order 2A, it should be as, as indicated, that is by 4pm on 18 August 2020. And then there's no contention with respect to the date for the exchange uh, of reply witness statements, that is the 1st of October. And the, the, the trial bundle index dates are all agreed. Again, this of course is all on the assumption that there'll be a trial on the 7th of December. Um, which I, so I can't guarantee, I don't know if anybody's been in touch with the court in the meantime, but I know I've got problems in that first week of September, that, that week starting the 7th, I've got, if it goes right up to the 20th, I don't, anyway, we'll just have to, we'll just have to um, deal with that. Um, then, uh, then looking through the skeleton arguments again, if, if, if that doesn't end up being the trial date, then all these dates can be adjusted. Um, but order, order three would be changed so to read, uh, there'll be, I, I think rather than be a CMC applications hearing, I just say there'll be the dates of the 9th and 10th of September will be reserved for uh, a CMC hearing 
Would we take two days, do you think, Ms Rogers? It's hard to see how we could take two days if it's properly prepared. It is indeed, but, but some of the interlocutory hearings in this case have taken rather longer than we had originally anticipated. Yeah. So that, that's yes. an estimate right. for the official experience. All right, well, let's let's reserve the 9th and the 10th, and if we don't need both days, then so much the better. But I'll reserve a date for hearing on the 9th and 10th, and then any application to be heard. Um, I'm just wondering, the 25th of August, if we're pushing it back three or four days, the 25th, what day of the week is that? That's... That's a Tuesday. That's a Tuesday. What if we push that back to... Uh, when's the 9th? And, the 9th and 10th is... Well, let's well let's let's just make that Wednesday. Make that Wednesday, the twenty sixth of August. Just so there's a little bit longer. There's eight days. Um, any evidence in response? By let's make it instead of the thirtieth, the thirtieth of August. That's pretty tight. Um, let's make it the the third. Third, 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 of, third, third of September. Thank you. And then skeleton arguments should be um, should be filed on the let's make it the sixth of September. I'm grateful. Um, and then the rest of the order can remain the same. So then let's go to the order in relation to disclosure. I don't, is there anything that I need to do here? <laughs> Sadly, so there are two two issues in relation to this order. One, a yes. small point as to the scope of disclosure, uh, and then secondly, an issue as to the costs of the set aside application. So those yes. are the issues. Yes. Disclosure first, if that's convenient. Yes. Uh, yes. Everything that you see in this order is agreed, other than the cut off dates when searches yes. start. End. So if you see, for example, in three B date range. Um, yes. Cut off of the 10th of March that the defendants are batting for. Uh, and again, in paragraph four, where there are categories of disclosure identified, uh, in paragraph 4A, they're batting to end their searches on the 10th of March itself. Now, the significance of the 10th of March is that it was the date on which this court yes. issued its interim injunction. Uh, and yes. the premise seems to be, well, after that point, by definition, there will be nothing to disclose and so no searches are required. Uh, and we do say, Your Excellency, that that's not right. Um, the claimants have real and serious concerns that Mr Olianju has, in fact, remained active in the financial markets, assisting GMG since the date of that order. Can I just take you back to Ms John's evidence on that front? Yes, yeah, so I, I, re I, read, I read that earlier. All she says is that somebody, people have said to her, people have said things that they've, they've been hearing from Mr Oluwangi, but she doesn't say who they were or what they said. No, she doesn't, and, and for this reason... It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's non-specific hearsay, isn't it? What, she gives as much detail as she can for this reason. Uh, these, the, these markets operate by reference to broker-trader relationships. And the claimants, as it stands at the moment, fears that if they were to identify the specific traders in question, or specific market sources in question, there would be issues of client confidentiality and, and incriminations that have commercial consequences. So she says as much as she properly can, as the position stands at present, which is this, that more than one trader at a major investment bank has stated to brokers at TPI cap that they have had contact with Mr. Ole Angio in relation to transactions in African products since April 2020. Now, now two and what, 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 what would the relevance of that be? Let's say there was evidence to that effect. How would it be relevant to the trial on liability and injunctive relief? Well, it, it, would be relevant, it would be relevant clearly to an application for contempt and it would be relevant to Mr. Ole Angio's credit, but would it be relevant to any issue in the trial? It would, uh, and it would be relevant in two ways. First, there's the question, what injunction should be granted at the end of this process? And uh, if the position is, and transpires to be, that the injunction presently in place on an interim basis hasn't been sufficient to restrain these defendants, there will be a very live question as to what further or ancillary or uh, supplemental injunction, injunctive relief is necessary going forward on a permanent basis. 
So it will colour and give texture to the question for the court, what final injunction should be granted? It, it's also relevant, Your Excellency, to this question of liability. Uh, before the court can go off in due course and make any quantum findings, it has to be clear, well, what were the scope of the wrongs that were committed? And there is a difference there between a wrong that stops on the 10th of March because it was restrained by injunction and a wrong that continues after that date in breach of contract, and we would say wrongfully induced by GMG, which will ultimately, one, give rise to a question of injunctive relief, but also, two, uh, at a later date, give rise to a claim for damages. So, so it's not, I think, merely, obviously, of itself that, that serious. It's not merely a question of breach of the injunction. It goes right to the heart of what is the wrong that has been committed and over what period. So we say for, for both liability and injunctive relief, it is a relevant issue. Yes, all right. And as this, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, now, do you want to deal with the question of costs? Uh, that's the other question. You want to deal with that, or should I hear from Mr. Mahmood in relation to time? Uh, entirely in your hands, whichever is more convenient. Yes. Well, it might be more convenient if I hear from Mr. Mahmood in relation to this timing issue now. Mr. Mahmood? Uh, yes, uh, Your Excellency, there is an issue on this, uh, and the issue is this. Again, I, I go back to the point that I made before. Uh, we have agreed the wording of the injunction order, uh, sorry, uh, the, the wording of the disclosure order, uh, without prejudice to our view that this is entirely irrelevant. But the suggestion that <clears throat> the order ought to be widened up to the present date in itself is, in my submission, going a step too far. Not only is that entirely irrelevant to the pleaded issues, but it's utterly disproportionate. Uh, and I, uh, and you, your, your Excellency will have uh, certainly my skeleton argument when, uh, on the issues of relevance. Um, I've yeah. made reference to a number of points in my skeleton argument. I, I'm not going to repeat all the points. Plainly, Your Excellency is fully familiar with these kinds of points. But the point in very simple terms is that the disclosure order that was made in this case mirrored the wording as would be applied in English law. But other than that, the expectation was that the BIC rules would apply. Uh, and plainly, whether one applies the GIC rules or indeed the English authority rules, all of them speak at least in one voice and one point. A disclosure is limited to matters that are relevant. The court would not ordinarily entertain, uh, entertain disclosure requests which are designed to, to obtain matters on credit and or, or lines of inquiry that might lead to credit-based issues. Uh, and when determining issues of relevance, all of the authorities that I've cited refer to one very particular point, that the court is expected to look at the pleadings to identify what are the live issues rather than invite the parties to engage in speculative exercises as to what might happen in the future. Uh, and so when, with that in mind, uh, Your Excellency, I've made reference to four authorities in particular. If Your Excellency requires, I can take you to those points, but they no. are contained in the authorities of... I'm sorry. Yes. No, no that's, I, don't, I don't need to go to the cases. If you can just summarise the propositions, Mr Mahmood, that would be convenient. Certainly. Certainly. The case of Harrods versus Times newspaper, it, it is at tab 8, page 126, that when deciding issues of relevance, the court is expected to go to the pleadings uh, and obviously understand the pleadings and then identify what is relevant. You have the case of Royal Mail Group versus DAF, which is a 2018 authority, which makes the same point and, and, uh, and talks about the issue of necessity when, when considering relevance by reference to pleadings. You have the case of Favour Easy Management versus Wu, which talks about documents that go to matters of credit and not relevant documents and don't fall within the provisions of standard disclosure, uh, certainly not in the words that have been agreed in this case. And lines of inquiry documents also don't fall within that scope. The question for this court really is this. Are the documents that are being sought relevant or sufficiently relevant to warrant disclosure? Uh, and your, your Excellency will be aware of the relevant rules when it comes to the DIFC, which, which also effectively say the same point at 28, uh, which, which make the point very clear that the court is expected to engage in issues of materiality, relevance, proportionality, and fairness, and so on. Now, with that in mind, uh, Your Excellency, can I just simply highlight to you what in reality are the issues, notwithstanding the submissions that have been made? Uh, Your Excellency will, will have seen from the pleadings. What is said is that the second defendant is contractually tied to the claimant and will remain tied to the claimant for a very long time into the future. Uh, and it's said that by... Well, well just, just, just pausing, sorry, Mr. Mahmoud, Mahmoud. Just, just, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, just pausing there. You say a very long time in the future. 
he had a 12 month he had a 12 month notice period and then a six month restraint didn't he or, or when when uh, when no, no. They, so sorry i'm so sorry are you uh, when when would he be eligible when will when will the if you like the the binds of the employment contract cease uh, it's early 2022, years. isn't it? Uh, it, it it's, it's April 2022. When it, If you give notice in April 21, yes. the contract finishes in April 22, and then it right. said that the six-month covenant will kick in, so that would be the October 2022. Right, okay. So coming, right. coming back to the main point, the main point in the, in the, the, the way the case has been framed is set out in the particulars of claim in very clear terms that... Uh, page eight, that, that uh, essentially what is being said is that the clay of the second defendant has obtained employment during that minimum term. In other words, between, uh, between the dates, 1st of May 19 to the 30th of April 2021, and it's suggested that as a result of him obtaining employment with the first defendant, he stands in breach, regardless of whatever the reasons might be for getting that employment, he's in breach because the contract was not repudiated. And that is the point also essentially made in my Learn from Skeleton argument at uh, page, at paragraph 10, page 6, forgive me, tab 6, page 8. Uh, essentially what is being said there is that the, the claimant has no right, to, forgive me, the second defendant has no right to work for a competitor. And that's pretty much the end of the issue as far as the uh, claimants are concerned. Uh, and I'll just find the exact wording. It's, this is how it's put. In fact, Mr. Oliangio had started work for GMG and the DIC on or around the 3rd of February 2020. The defendants contend that his work for GMG is unrelated to any African product and unrelated to his former role for the TPI cap. Uh, that is factually wrong, but in any event, legally irrelevant. Mr. Oliangio has no right to assist a competitor, competitor in any capacity while still a serving employee. So the cause of action, it said, is crystallizes the moment he obtained the job and that, that is the issue on liability. In, in simple terms, it is said that on the 3rd of February, by obtaining employment, he committed a breach of contract. Now, it's, it's an indisputed fact that he commenced work on the 3rd of February. It's also indisputable that an injunction was ordered on the 10th of March. Uh, so when one addresses the issues of liability, please do bear in mind this trial is currently limited to only issues of liability. One is left to ponder the question, what possible relevance has this line of inquiry, which requires disclosure to go beyond the injunction date, uh, what, what possible relevance does that have to the issue of liability? Uh, and the answer is it doesn't. In reality, what is being sought, as is now apparent from Ms. John's witness statement at paragraph 45, which is at uh, tab 2, uh, and, I, and uh, Your Excellency, I won't trouble you by asking you to turn to it, I'll just read out the paragraph. Mm. This is what it says, and this is all that we have. More than one trader at a major investment bank and a key former customer of OO have stated to broker the PPI cap that they have had contact from OO in relation to transactions in African products in the period April 2020 to date. That is it. There is literally nothing else. And then we have, of course, my learned friend's note, which was uh, kindly prepared this morning, which seeks to take that matter further forward, I submit with respect and properly. Uh, at paragraph 10 of Malone Friend's note, she says without any evidence that uh, they've heard from three different market sources that Mr. Alian Joe continues to work in the market. Firstly, Malone Friend can't give evidence on the point. Secondly, Ms. John doesn't say that in her statement. And thirdly, there is no evidence in the matter whatsoever. So in reality, it seems that the purpose of this exercise is to find information with a view to, to, to launching some kind of contempt action. So it's, it's essentially a collateral attack on his credibility and or has, a, has an ulterior purpose behind it. But what it doesn't go to, no matter how much Malone attempts to take it there, is to the issue of liability. So in, in, in a nutshell, I say the disclosure request beyond the 10th of March is entirely irrelevant. It's designed for an ulterior purpose and it is plainly a fishing expedition. Now, that's my first and primary objection. The second objection is on the issue of proportionality. If your excellency would kindly turn to the proposed order. Yes. Just 
So I have it. Thank you. If you please, we have it. Thank you. Uh, can I just make one correction, first of all? Um, the, the date range is relevant to all the paragraphs, not simply paragraphs three and four. It's also relevant to paragraph yes. two. So two Roman numeral one, we suggest, should be limited also up to the 10th of March. I've made that clear to my own friend in, in an email previously. Yes. And uh, paragraph three is... Well, sorry, so then just, just, sorry, Mr. Mamet, just to be clear then, we should say paragraph 2A should be amended then, yes. so that with used all material time since one, should be all material times between 1 November 2019 and 10 March 2020, should it? That, that's right. And that has a, yes. uh, that's one way of amending it. The alternative way of amending it is to simply go to paragraph B, Roman numeral 1, and where it says yes. through their legal representative conduct a further search of those telephone and SIM cards for documents, I, I propose the word between the period 1st of November 01 to 10th of March 2020. It's just that I suppose it, theoretically it, 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 if, they, if they've got a new phone, if they've got a new card, if they've got a new phone after the 10th of yes. March, it would be caught by A, but not by B. It might be easier to do it in A, I think. In, in A, yes, I agree. Yes. Now, now if, yes. You, if your excellency looks at paragraph three, paragraph three, this, this is where one can raise judicial eyebrows. The date range is up to the current date being proposed. And the search is, is supposed to encompass practically everything that's happened since, uh, and including searches involving Morozov, who of course is a witness to these proceedings, Yoni, uh, Jenny, Rudman, and as to Mr. Yoli and Joe, the, the words, the key words are DISC, Dubai, Morozov, Rudman. Now, uh, this would, in my submission, lead to an unreasonable and disproportionate level of work because one would imagine for the last five, six months, there would plainly be communication between individuals and witnesses, or, uh, and there will plainly be documents that refer to Dubai, for example, given that that's where Mr. Alianjo is based. And what the, uh, the claimants are proposing is that somebody undertakes that search, and then the lawyers are supposed to sit there weeding out all the documents that are relevant uh, that would be, in my submission, utterly disproportionate and hugely costly. Now, my own friend in her skeleton note has proposed in a footnote that in the event there is a, there is a, there is a lot of information, it says, if there isn't any unexpected issues as to proportionality, the parties will liaise with the defence and narrow or refine the necessary searches. And that, I say, with a resounding uh, no, is not practical, because what is being proposed here is that the, the order is left open-ended, and at the claimant's discretion, they will then liaise with us to see whether they deem it necessary to limit the issues for us. That's simply going to lead to satellite litigation of, of, a, of completely frivolous kind. So in short, I have concerns about relevance and motive. I also have concerns about proportionality, <laughs> and uh, that proportionality should be assessed by reference to the fact <clears throat> that this will be the fourth time that the exercise is now being conducted. And in a case where the costs, are, according to the claimant, have now exceeded a million pounds, one has to keep proportionality in, in account. Those are my submissions. Well, <coughs> yes, Ms. Rogers, reply? Briefly, Your Excellency, yes. First of all, the question of relevance. And standing back and focusing here particularly, because as will be apparent, this is what particularly concerns the claimant, on the request in paragraph 4.3 of the order, i.e. documents evidencing the work done and proposed to be done by Mr. Aliangi on GMG's behalf. That's the real crux of it. Now, the pleaded issue, the ultimate pleaded issue, is whether Mr. Aliangi threatens and intends to continue to breach his employment contract during the remaining fixed term, and in what respects, and whether that is induced by GMG in a way that is legally actionable. Standing back for a moment, it cannot sensibly be said in my submission that documents that bear on whether and to what extent Mr. Ole Andrew has in fact been working for GMG in that period are irrelevant. Leave aside the question of the injunction. Imagine no injunction had ever been granted. The question for the court would be, well, what has he done in breach of his contract so I can make my findings as to liability? And what relief, what injunctive relief is appropriate in light of those findings? Whatever can be said about the scope of the issues generally and um, the, uh, everything that Mr. Mahmood has been through, that core issue, that question of what he has been doing in breach of his employment contract is fundamental to liability. And as I submitted earlier, 
also bears on the scope and the texture and the nature of the final injunctive relief. So that's relevance. Secondly, Your Excellence, proportionality. And again, focusing in particular on that paragraph 4.3, which is the core concern on part of surveillance. The defendant's position is that nothing has been done since the 10th of March 2020, nothing at all. If that is right, the answer to the request in paragraph 4.3 of the draft order will be there are no documents to disclose, there is nothing. And that will be a very short, swift and clear confirmation that you would expect to be forthcoming without difficulty. Now, uh, all it's raised as to the scope of searches, uh, I have no difficulty uh, in agreeing that that's the particular concern, that the particular keyword searches don't need to continue necessarily to date. The real heart of it, as I said, uh, as I opened this part of the application, is about the work that Mr. Oliandu has done with clients, and that is 4A3 of the draft order. Uh, and that is the critical part of the application as to which no sensible concern as to proportionality can be raised. Yes, so, thank you. Yes. Oh, one short sure point, and I, I won't trespass on your patience any longer, uh, is only this. Um, return to the point that you raised with me and was raised by a learned friend as to the nature of Ms John's exercise, uh, Ms John's evidence. I don't add only this. At, at the outset of these proceedings, when we appeared before the court seeking interim injunctive relief, in precisely the same way, we had learned from market sources that Mr Olianju was active in the market and was working at GMG. Notwithstanding GMG's threats of criminal defamation and the like, that transpired to be true. So when Ms. John is senior counsel at TPI CAP, says in her statement that the claimants have serious concerns, this is what has happened now, uh, that is said with, with proper consideration and with good grounds. So I do invite you to uh, make an order at the very least in the terms of formal agreement. Yes, thank you, Ms. Rogers. Uh, I'm, I'm not persuaded that the order should go beyond the date of the 10th of March for the reasons which I'll shortly outline. Uh, the first is that on the 10th of March 2020, an injunction was granted by this court restraining Mr Olianju from uh, undertaking any role of employment with the first defendant. Uh, the claimant asserts that there is information that suggests that Mr Olianju has breached that injunctive order. That's a very serious allegation. Um, I don't regard the evidence that has been referred to, and I, I don't, don't say there's been any evidence adduced, there's been reference, oblique reference to statements made by others who aren't identified. I don't regard that evidence as providing a sufficiently serious base for an allegation of that kind uh, in order to sustain uh, the claim for disclosure. The second is that I don't, I'm not satisfied that the relevance of the documents if they exist, uh, which is not to be assumed, of course, but even if there are documents in that category, I'm not satisfied that they would be sufficiently relevant to the matters in issue to justify the work that would be involved in searching for them and producing them. And I say that essentially for the reasons given by Mr Mahmood. The claimant's case is not a case for acting contrary to a restraint of trade provision prior to the termination of an employment contract. The claimant's case is based on the proposition that Mr uh, Olianju has breached his employment contract by taking employment with someone else. That case um, doesn't depend upon the nature of the other employment. It depends upon the proposition that Mr Olianju has not made himself available to the claimants in order to serve them. Uh, the nuances of what he's actually been doing don't seem to me to be particularly germane or relevant to the trial which is listed in relation to uh, liability and injunctive relief and the injunctive relief with respect to Ms Rogers' submissions I don't see will be fashioned um, with any great regard to what it is that Mr Olianju is doing. If his claimant's case is made out, he will be restrained from undertaking any employment for anybody else, I would have thought. Um, so, and the third reason is proportionality. I'm very concerned that this case is already running contrary to the overriding obligation imposed by Rule 1.6, which requires that uh, the steps to be taken in preparation and the trial itself be proportional to the matters in issue. Uh, we're talking about it now, talking about a 10 day trial, no doubt at very considerable expense in relation to matters that will, I think, have an expiry. Um, within 18 months or so of the conduct of the trial. Um, I think there is a real risk that 
costs have already been incurred in amounts which are disproportionate to the real value of these issues and will continue to be incurred uh, in disproportion to the real value of these issues. So I think it behoves the managing judge, uh, consistent with Order uh, Rule 1.6, to try and keep proportionality well within bounds, despite the apparent efforts of the parties to um, spend a lot of money in the preparation and presentation of this case in a way which I have to say seems to me to be already disproportionate uh, to the real value of the issues. Uh, but for those reasons, um, the orders that I would make will be limited to uh, the period between 1 November 2019 and 10 March 2020, and that limitation should also entry, be introduced into the text of paragraph 2A. So it'll be at all, in that paragraph, it'll be at all material times between 1 November 2019 and 10 March 2020. Now, I might move on then to the costs issue. Ms Rogers, would it be convenient for you to go first on that? Certainly, certainly, Your Excellency. Uh, I, the headline submission is that I think my costs of the application to set aside your order in relation to witness summaries. Uh, let me take that in three stages. First, if I may, the background and how we've ended up where we've ended up. Uh, you've already adverted in the course of this morning, or this afternoon as it must be, Your Excellency, to the yes. court case management order from June 2020, requiring that statements be served by last Thursday. Now, of course, that order itself didn't come out of the blue. The parties had been discussing directions for some time before that and had even been discussing the prospect of a trial in May with witness statements and email. But certainly as of June 2020, the defendants knew they had two months to prepare their evidence. Uh, next question, Your Excellency, did they know who to call at that stage? Well, on any view of material part, yes. Their case management information sheet identified uh, a number of individuals, three of whom, plus Mr. Orly Andrew, are former TPI CAP employees. So again, that's the 9th of June, more than two months before any statements, or around two months before any statements are due to be served. And Dees well know that there are particular witnesses that they intend to call to give relevant evidence at trial. Next question, Your Excellency, did the defendants take any steps, any serious steps at all, to prepare that evidence? Uh, if you have the witness summaries bundle, or maybe you recall the documents sufficiently, yes. the letters that went out to those individuals were the 21st of July. So weeks have passed. We're right up against the deadline for statements to be prepared and exchanged. And what we see is an initial request for confirmation that these individuals might give evidence, an attempt to arrange a very first meeting or discussion, uh, no steps before that, plainly, to progress what the court had directed must be, must be progressed. And in fact, more than that, in relation to those three individuals that were named in the case management information sheet, we now know from one of Mr Singh's most recent statements that one of them, as all such, actually has no relevant evidence to give at all. So the, notwithstanding that she was named on the 9th of June, notwithstanding that no approach to her was made until the end of July, it now transpires she adds nothing to the picture. N next question, Your Excellency, is this. Were the defendants hampered in a material way by suddenly discovering that their witnesses or potential witnesses had signed settlement agreements that caused real problems? Uh, and the answer to that is no. Uh, again, focusing on the three that appeared in the case management information sheet, Neither Ms. Allsuch nor Ms. Beleaga had signed any settlement terms for TPI cap, so that's a red herring. Ms. Von Faber, the third individual, didn't sign those terms until the very end of July, so after this application was even made. Now, now pause in relation to the other named individuals in the application as it came before you. Two of them are Mr. Morozov and Mr. Rudman. Now, Mr. Morozov and Mr. Rudman worked for GMG, and they worked for GMG since the beginning of February. If GMG had wanted them to give evidence and had wanted to establish if there was any impediment to that cause, it could have asked them at any stage during the course of this litigation, not leaving it till the 21st of July. Uh, and more than that, the defendants must have known that Mr. Morozov and Mr. Rudman had signed settlement terms for TPICAP, because that was the very reason that they couldn't start at GMG before February 2020. That's when the English court's injunction came to an end, and the, the final injunction specifically refers to a, co a confidential settlement agreement between the parties. 
So, so again, if there was any concern about the terms of the settlement or whether some consent was needed from the claimants, it could have been considered and raised at any point during the course of this litigation, not simply left to the 21st of July. But, but pause the chronology even there, Your Excellency. What, what happens? Well, the 21st of July, these letters go out to the witnesses, uh, uh, including Ms. Adebayi, Ms. Carr, and the others. On the 22nd of July, in relation to at least at least end of two individuals, and on the 23rd of July for another, it transpires that there may be some issue as to settlement terms. Now, of course, that, the delay in learning of that is of the defendant's own making. If they'd approached these witnesses before the last minute, they'd have discovered that fact before the last minute. But, but two, having discovered the fact of settlement terms, what did the defendants do? Did they pick up the phone to the claimants to say, there's an issue, can you clarify? They did not. Did they write to the claimants saying, there are potential witnesses and there are issues as to settlement agreements? They did not. Had they done so, they would immediately have been told that there was no issue with these individuals giving evidence as transpired the following week. But they don't do that. Sunday, the 26th of July, they issue the application. They do that ex parte as the rules provide, but they do not serve it on the claimants. They don't notify the claimants that the order was being sought. Uh, and the claimants discovered the fact of that application and then Your Excellency's order on the 29th of July whereupon they wrote by return saying that there really is no issue. TPI kept does not purport to restrain anyone from giving evidence to this court and certainly doesn't do so in relation to these individuals. All of that and the fact that it came uh, on the 29th and 30th of July is a product of the defendant's failure properly to progress the steps that were necessary in relation to this litigation until the very last minute. Uh, and a defendant, Your Excellency, who's trying to meet court deadlines, who's trying to get its house in order to ensure that a trial is ready to proceed, engages with these issues, uh, and these defendants didn't do that. So, so standing back on this first point, if one asks the question, well, why was this application necessary when it was? Why couldn't these defendants serve statements rather than summaries? The, the short answer, and in my submission, the only realistic answer when you have the chronology clear, is that they'd run out of time, they'd run out of road. Uh, and that is their lookout. Secondly, Your Excellency, the application itself was materially deficient. Now, the, the court obviously is reliant on an applicant for an ex parte order to put a full and frank account of the issues before the court. And the question whether to pick witness summaries had both a threshold element, were they unable to serve statements, and a discretionary element as to the value of the evidence, the risk of disruption to the trial, prejudice to the other party, and so forth. But the defendant's application before you wholly failed to engage with the consequences of the order that they were asking the court to make. Uh, Your Excellency may recall Mr Singh's evidence, I can give you the reference if you'd like to turn it up, but, but what matters for my purpose is that there was an assertion that the defendants could not serve statements from these witnesses. There was a bare assertion that the witnesses could give highly relevant evidence, although in at least one case that turns out not to be true at all. Uh, but what was the court not told? Well, at least four things. One, the court wasn't told that there was any risk that the application would put the trial date at risk and that calling evidence by summaries from all of these witnesses that might mean a trial in September was impossible. Two, the court wasn't told of the immediate and obvious prospect that the claimants would say that this evidence was insufficiently relevant to justify its admission by way of witness summaries. And on the authorities, when you're considering whether to grant permission for witness summaries, one of the issues is, well, not, not just is the evidence conceivably relevant, but how relevant is it? And is it appropriate, given its nature, that it comes by way of summaries and not by way of statements? Uh, and just taking one of these individuals, Ms. Carr, as an example, she left TPI cap in March 2017. So that is months before even the first of the defendants pleaded allegations in relation to Mr. Alianji. Whatever she may say, it isn't going to be highly relevant admissible evidence as to whether those allegations are or are not true or are or not made out. She, she left. She was out of the building significantly before that. Ms. Adebayi is another, worked in a back office role in a completely different building to Mr. Oliangu. She's not going to be able to give any evidence as to what happened on that particular desk uh, and so on and so on through the others. And the short point is this, that the court was not told and should have been told that there were likely to be significant issues as to the scope of the evidence. Third, 
Directs and see this. The court was not told of the prejudice to the claimants uh, if the defendants were permitted to proceed at trial with nine or 12 witnesses and fully seven of those presenting summaries only and not statements in relation to a trial starting in just over a month. And fourth, no acknowledgement in that application that almost all of these individuals were out of the jurisdiction and that if the defendants were going to need summons to produce them, there were going to be jurisdictional issues in that regard. So the timing of the application was a matter of the defendant's own making. And the application itself, we do say, was not one that fairly presented the issues to the court. Third, then, Your Excellency, let me deal head on with two points that are made in Mr Singh's witness statement to, to explain, or to seek to explain the defendant's conduct. One is the suggestion that the claimant should have volunteered consent in advance of learning of these issues and learning of the application. Now, that, that is, with respect, to a, a completely impossible submission. Of the witnesses of whom the claimants had been made aware in the case management information sheet, none of them had signed settlement agreements until Ms. Von Saber did so after the date of the application itself. And the notion that the claimant should have been anticipating that there were other unidentified witnesses the defendants might wish to call, who might be subject to terms that might be misunderstood to prevent them giving evidence, is at some degree of speculation. The second point Mr Singh makes is this, well, you know, sh should the claimant have waited before issuing the application? Well, that, that is not, in my submission, realistic. This application had to be issued promptly and it had to become, before your lordship today, uh, at the hearing at which you would be considering specific disclosure, but also inevitably considering the issues in advance of the trial and the shape of the trial. But, but, but Ms Rogers, why didn't you ask them after you advised them, after your solicitors advised them that the witnesses were released from any obligations of confidence, why wasn't an inquiry made as to whether it was still proposed that they that summaries be provided before launching the application? Well, well for two reasons, Your Excellency. One is that they were on notice by that letter that an application would be made to set aside the order. And but if but why, didn't you, why, did, why didn't you ask them? Why didn't you say, well, now that we're because there is no basis now for you not speaking to them, do you wish to continue with summaries or do we have to apply for an order? Well, the, the fundamental issue, Your Excellency, is this. I mean, th this is, we are now on the 31st or 30th of July, in advance of a hearing that was coming on in this court on the 9th of August. The defendants had already been saying in relation to disclosure, oh, well, there are difficulties in time to prepare and more time must be allowed. In circumstances in which we considered that the application and the order threatened the trial date, uh, as amongst other reasons it ha has now transpired to do, the only proper course in those circumstances was to get on and issue. And delaying by days or a week to discuss with the defendants precisely what their intentions were in that regard would simply have meant the issue couldn't come before you today. We couldn't have used this hearing date. Uh, and there would have been, well, it, as things transpired as a fait accompli that the hearing can't proceed, but, but the position would have been a fortiori. So the, the only responsible cause at that stage, looking at this hearing in the court's diary for which the parties are prepared, is we had to get on an issue. Yes, all right. Yes, all right, thank you. Mr Mahmood. Uh, yes, uh, your, your Excellency, have, uh, uh, there are a number of points that I want to make, some of, some of which I've made previously, so I'll be very brief on those points. Uh, my friend has essentially said that um, the application to adduce witness summaries by my solicitors was improperly made, uh, and, and they say that they was, there was material deficiency. And secondly, they say that the only way of remedying the position was by them making the application uh, that, they, that they suddenly did without waiting for us. Now, just dealing with those matters briefly, if I may. Uh, firstly, as I said previously, there is a case information management sheet in which, uh, on the 11th of June, my instructing solicitors identified five witnesses three of whom were potentially caught, or at least it was believed they may be caught by some kind of confidentiality provision. Uh, and certainly, uh, Your Excellency granted a, an order subsequent to that, which referred to those three and, uh, and, and allowed witness summaries to be produced in relation to those. Now, Mr. Singh prepared his initial statement and then a subsequent statement. And in those statements, he explained in clear detail why he believed the, that they, the, the, the defendants were unable to obtain statements and that's the extent of the relevant rule under Rule 29.5. The timing of his, of his application is, is completely irrelevant to the issue of 
whether or not costs ought to be paid in the circumstances. There might well be a criticism, as your Excellency alluded to earlier, about the failure to do, to do anything between June and July, but that has no significance on the issue of the application that is currently before the court. Now, the, the, the relevant part, uh, your Excellency, is that in that statement itself, in the case management information sheet, rather, it was made absolutely clear that we were expecting disclosure to cover a broad range of issues. And in that document, which is at tab 5, page 68, four particular points were made, and only two of which are relevant for this purpose. The point made was that uh, part of the second sentence claim is about the reason he resigned it is because the claimant failed to take reasonable and proper steps to prevent the treatment he was subjected to, uh, and a, there was a failure to adhere to proper procedure. And the point he made was that he was, they were expecting documents in relation to complaints made by other employees alleging harassment and race discrimination. And in that context, they said, at present, we rely on the following witnesses as fact. However, this may change on receipt of disclosure and whether the claims have complied with the defendant's specific request uh, for disclosure in the 17th of March letter. Now, the 17th of March letter, uh, Your Excellency, is relevant because in that letter, uh, my instructions list has identified a whole range of disclosures they were expecting, which necessarily encompassed other employees, including Mr. Morisov, Mr. Rudman, and so on. So it was plain as a pike staff to the other side that this case was not as narrow as they, as they appear to contend. The Appendix 1 made reference to Anton Morozov and, and Polina Valensky and so on and so forth. So th there was always a scope for additional witnesses to be adduced. Now, I accept, of course, the criticism that uh, the, the, those instructions then waited till the 21st of July before making contact with the witnesses. But that has zero bearing on the, the subsequent application. The application was made because the witnesses were not prepared to engage. And that has been stated with a statement of truth twice by Mr. Singh in his witness statement. And I ask you to accept that uh, rather than the improper motive which is being attributed to him through assertions from the other side. So the question really is this, was the application itself uh, justified in the circumstances? Plainly it was, and did it satisfy the relevant test in the under 29.50? Plainly, it did. It did because the court read the documents and made an order, and there's no suggestion that the court was, in that regard, wrong in making the order. The test being whether or not the claimants can, uh, are unable to obtain a statement. The rule doesn't require one to explain why they're unable, simply to justify that they are unable. But in actual fact, Mr. Singh explained why he wasn't able to do that. Now, my learned friend suggests that with hindsight, perhaps we ought to have obtained their consent beforehand. And that, I, I submit, really does seek to take the benefit of hindsight and substitute that with foresight. It, this is a case in which we had already identified a number of witnesses. They already knew that at least two of them may have confidentiality provisions. They were already aware that one of them, Polina, was still in employment and had, uh, had, recently gone, uh, had recently issued a grievance against her employer and was now being represented by lawyers. So it would not have taken a genius for, for them to recognize but there was a significant issue as to whether these witnesses were going to give evidence. And yet they didn't proffer any consent. Now, McMillan says, well, why should they volunteer consent in those circumstances? Well, for two reasons. Firstly, they knew that there were confidentiality provisions affecting at least two people. And secondly, they also had the experience of the Morozov litigation, which had only concluded in 2019, during which similar issues had arisen. And witness summaries had to be obtained, one from my own client, from my own client, the second defendant. So they knew of the very distinct real possibility that this was going to be an issue. And yet they waited until after the order was obtained, and then on the 30th of July gave consent, which was equivocal, according to the solicitor representing Polina. And they gave their unequivocal consent in writing on the 4th of August. That was the real date when they had that. So it, the first issue I addressed by simply saying, uh, the application was properly made, so there's no basis for any kind of cost or criticism. The second issue is, why, uh, why did the defendant claimant simply issue their application? And are they deserving of cost in relation to that? Uh, and that involves a separate issue. And the issue is this. Uh, Your Excellency already has, has my point. They indicated their consent on the 30th of July. That was a, a, the start of a bank holiday weekend. The very first day back from that bank holiday weekend, the 3rd of August, my instructing solicitors yeah, immediately wrote to them saying, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we know that you have no objection to any of them giving the evidence. We intend to serve witness statements accordingly. In other words, 
had they simply waited or even picked the phone to mind something for this run on mobile, perhaps during the holiday season, they would have had an answer. But they acted extraordinarily prematurely uh, and with great uh, aggression by issuing an application and now seek £28,000 worth of cost for, for an application that should never have been made. And notwithstanding that, notwithstanding the fact that on the 3rd of August we told them in very clear terms we will now uh, obtain witness statements, they've continued with their application and they've incurred a brief fee on that, yet, and yet they've known all along that we have no intention of objecting to that. Now, the, this leads me to the third matter and the real matter in this point. The real purpose of continuing with the application, Your Excellency, is not because the claimants are seeking to set aside uh, an order which we've always agreed to set aside. The real purpose is, is that they intended during today's hearing to limit the relevant evidence. And that's obvious from my learned sense skeleton argument because the vast majority of the skeleton argument on this issue talks about relevant evidence and the circumstances in which the court can restrict it. But in reality, what the, the other side was seeking to do today was to convince you that you have power to manage the evidence and therefore you ought to manage that evidence today. And as Melanson has, has already conceded, that particular issue is yet to be decided by the court and they may raise that argument at the next hearing. So in summary, I say our application was properly made in uh, perfectly properly and the court endorsed it as such. Uh, the witness application or the application made by the claimant is wholly improper and premature. And thirdly, the, the true purpose of their application and the reason why they claim to have incurred £28,000 worth of cost is because they were seeking to limit the evidence, which is an issue that is going to be decided in the future, not today. But in all those circumstances, I, I submit uh, it primarily, first of all, that the court should consider awarding the, the defendant their cost because they've had to incur considerable costs in responding to this detailed application that should never have been made. If Your Excellency is against me on that, I submit there should be no risk of cost, which means neither side should benefit from the situation. Uh, those are my submissions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mahmoud. Ms. Rogers, in reply? Uh, certainly, Your Excellency, no question that the defendants receiving their costs and circumstances in which um, the order is itself being set aside. Uh, just brief short points. First, the suggestion that the application was premature. Well, you have my submission on that. But it really, as I say, comes down to this. Why were we in such a compressed timetable before this hearing now? Why was there so limited time for the issue of application for the resolution of issues before we were before the court when the issues had to be resolved today? And the answer to that, and the only answer to that, is that it wasn't until the 21st of July that the defendants began this exercise. If they had properly engaged with their obligations under the case management orders and had started to progress these issues uh, at, at the proper and appropriate stage earlier in the process, there would be no question of this having come out on discussions on the 21st of July or applications on the 26th of July right up against uh, the deadline on the 6th of August in this hearing today. The compressed timetable and the difficulties that for both parties that has given rise to is a problem of the defendant's making and that is the fundamental submission. Secondly, Your Excellency, some suggestions from my learned friend that what came from the claimants on the 30th of July was equivocal. Well, uh, again, you may recall the letter, but if you don't, I would certainly invite you to, to cast an eye back over it. Absolutely plain from that letter, the claimants specifically confirm, you've never raised this question with us before. We don't believe that any of these individuals are prevented by settlement agreements from giving evidence to the court. We specifically confirm for the avoidance of any doubt whatsoever that neither of the claimants have any objection to any of the seven witnesses named above giving evidence to the DIFC court in these proceedings um, without prejudice to questions of relevance. Utterly unequivocal, utterly clear, and that is the answer they would have received if they had raised this issue with the claimants at any stage before the very end of July. Uh, thirdly, uh, only the suggestion again that came from my learned friend that we ought somehow to have been preempting their decisions to who to call as witnesses and when they might appear uh, 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 and uh, advancing the position of ourselves where even they hadn't yet identified and reached out to the relevant witnesses. I say that's a submission that, that certainly can't sensibly be sustained. It, it's the defendant's role to identify their evidence, to identify their witnesses and to prepare their statements. Uh, and the reason we're here today with this application having been dealt with in the way that it has is because they left that until the 59th minute of the 11th hour. 
Yes. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Uh, I, I must say, um, the, the, well, Professor Wayne Rikes, the issue that has arisen concerns the claimant's application for their costs of an application to set aside an order which I made ex parte, um, authorising the defendants to serve summaries of evidence rather than witness statements in relation to uh, a number of possible witnesses. It is, I think, important for the purpose of evaluating the cost issues that have arisen to go to the purpose for which the ex parte orders were sought. And that purpose had its origins in confidentiality obligations that a number of the witnesses had said uh, they considered precluded from them assisting the, claim, uh, the defendants by providing witness statements. Now, it's true that there is scope for criticism in relation to the ambit of that application and in respect of some prospective witnesses who hadn't even responded and in respect of the timing of that application. But it seems to me that those issues are really peripheral to the question of costs because the fundamental basis upon which the application was brought was the proposition that those witnesses were bound by confidentiality obligations either in their contracts of employment or in the terms of settlement agreements which they reached with the claimants which prevented them from providing witness statements. What is a more substantial criticism, I think, of the uh, defendants is that no inquiry was made of the claimants prior to launching that ex parte application as to whether or not the claimants were insisting upon uh, compliance uh, with the confidentiality obligations uh, on the part of those witnesses uh, and indeed whether they would enforce those confidential obligations to prevent them providing witness statements. Had that inquiry been made, um, it seems likely in the light of subsequent events that both the ex parte application and the application to set aside the ex parte orders could have been avoided. But that is uh, an observation by the, by the way because no application is made in respect of the costs of the ex parte order. The important point is that the ground upon, the substantive ground upon which that order was sought uh, was effectively removed when after receiving notice of the order the claimants promptly gave notice that they would not insist upon the performance of the confidentiality obligations and that they had no objection to the prospective witnesses speaking to the, wit to the defendants and providing statements to the defendants. What the claimants then did was immediately launch the proceedings to set aside the orders in respect of which costs are now sought. Uh, just as I criticised the uh, uh, defendants for not inquiring of the claimants as to whether it was necessary to obtain ex parte orders because the confidentiality obliga obligations were being insisted upon. So I think there is uh, grounds for just criticism of the claimants in not making any inquiry of the defendants as to whether or not they proposed to proceed to serve summaries after there had been a significant change in the claimant's position. That significant change being that it, they no longer insisted upon performance of the confidentiality obligations. Of course, as I say, had an inquiry been made, that point it might have been elucidated earlier. But the fact is no inquiry was made. Uh, but as soon as the claimants were served with the orders, uh, without any significant period elapsing, having regard to the holiday periods involved, uh, the proceedings were launched. Um, it seems to me that in that regard the claimants were hasty and that haste was unnecessary and that a short inquiry should have been made of the defendants as to whether or not the defendant still proposed to rely upon the orders which the claimants then moved to set aside. In those circumstances, I think failure to make that inquiry uh, was, ha has been in fact the source of the costs that were incurred, uh, the scope of which I think goes well beyond, uh, the scope of the cost claim goes well beyond what should have been a fairly short and simple application, uh, limited only to the relevant change in position that is the change in position in relation to confidentiality obligations, but as the defendants point out, the claimant's application uh, canvassed a lot more ground than that. Uh, to put it uh, shortly, I think both sides, frankly, were at fault um, in the way in which this whole issue was handled, and that fault stems from the failure to communicate adequately with each other. And with the greatest respect to the solicitors involved, the communications that I've seen in evidence seem to be largely directed to impugning each other's motives and the motives of their clients rather than making polite and sensible inquiries as to a cooperative course that would result in this case moving forward expeditiously and with minimum expense. But that's not to the point. The point is that in my view, uh, the proper order in relation to both the 
ex parte application for um, made by the defendants for leave to produce summaries and the claimant's application to set aside the ex parte orders, which I should note the proper course to follow is to make no order as to costs in respect of each of those applications. And so those, those will be the orders. Now what's left? That is the end of the shopping list. Oh, right. Can I just go back to, could I just go back to the order relating to I think it's called the order of adjournment. Just going back to order one, the liability trial be adjourned. I, I don't think I'm in a position to make that order because as I say, I can't I can't guarantee that there'll be a judge available on those dates. But it's also just looking at those dates, the seventh to the twentieth. The seventh is a, as I see a Monday. So it'd be starting on a Monday and then finishing on a Sunday. Is that is that what's proposed? So that seems rather odd. Because of course the, the normal week in Dubai is from Sunday to Thursday. But you're proposing starting on a on a Monday, going four to presumably four days that week, then five days the following week, and then the following Sunday. Is that is that really what you're proposing? On the face of it, it is, and we've been anticipating potentially that Sunday being closing submissions, having had a, a day in advance or the weekend in advance to gather thoughts. But, but equally, right. I, certainly we're not wedded to, to starting on the Monday, and if it suits the court right. better. Well, anyway, better. I, I, until until someone in the registry is told me we've got a judge available, then I don't think I can make those orders. Uh, but I can make it, but the trial be adjourned to take place in the court of first instance no earlier than the month of December uh, with a time estimate of 10 days. Um, as it happens, if it helps, I don't know what council's available. My, my other commitment is from the 8th to the 10th of December. Um, now, of course, that's the end of the Dubai week, but I could I could start on the 13th and then run through to the 24th, uh, which would be, the, so that'd be the 13th, the 17th and the 20th, the 24th. I don't know if that's helpful, but the registry may have another judge who'd be available to accommodate the dates proposed by the parties. Uh, but I think all I can do is just adjourn it to those dates and then people have to liaise with the registry about that, I'm afraid. But otherwise, I think um, I've dealt with everything in that order. And I think I've dealt with the everything in the consent order relating to disclosure. Um, yes. Uh, the only thing, costs of the specific disclosure application are reserved. I, I think just I think just reserved generally. So it may be that if there is no case management hearing on the 9th and 10th of September, we just reserve those costs generally, I think, in item seven of that order. Certainly. And they can be dealt with either by me if there is a case management hearing on those dates or by the trial judge if it's not me. Is there anything else? Not for the claimants. Uh, All right. Mr. Mahmood? Your Excellency, not for my part. Uh, not for my part. Okay, well, may I just simply say that I'm. My, my line drops off, I'm afraid, towards the end, and I've just read right. down back in. So can I just check that in terms of paragraph one, is Your Excellency proposing to uh, adjourn the trial to the 13th and 24th of December? That's all that I heard no, at that point. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Mahmood. What I'm proposing is that in that order, I will simply adjourn the trial to a date to be fixed no earlier than December um, uh, on the basis of an estimate of 10 days. Now, it may be that the registry Thank will be you. able to provide you with the dates that you seek, but without confirmation from them, I can't fix dates that the court may not be able to honour. I, I understand. Thank so, you very much so, for clarifying. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you can get those dates from the registry, then that'll be fine. But the, the order I'll make is the liability trial be adjourned, take place court of first instance no earlier than the month of December with a time and estimate of 10 days, agenda dates to be fixed. Okay. All right, that's fine. Thank you both for your assistance. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll finish the, finish the hearing now.